And I think the big formula for most YouTube channels is you've done the thing and now you actually have a desire to teach the thing. Because as soon as you shift into teach the thing, you actually might be able to build a bigger business than you ever even did doing the thing. Thank you for joining me on the Investing for Freedom podcast. I gotta say guys, I am extremely excited about this episode, selfishly, because I've got a great friend, but also someone who is just a genius in the world of YouTube. Sean Cannell is on the show today, and he's actually somebody who has really challenged me recently to increase my YouTube presence, which is why we're here. And he's one of the four most thought leaders. I had a conversation with Sean probably three to four months ago when I was in Mexico City, and Sean jumped on a call with me and we were talking about investing. But at the end of the call, Sean was like, he just pulled up my YouTube channel and he just started, you know, blasting me with wisdom. And I haven't been able to stop thinking about that ever since. And I've spent a lot of money and time and energy on Instagram and a lot of other channels, the podcast, et cetera. But the one thing that really stuck out to me is that I haven't put the amount of energy into YouTube. And Sean being the expert here has really challenged me. The other thing, we were at a Wellspring event that you know Sean and I are both in this mastermind group. And Sean, I don't even know if you know this, but afterwards I came back and I was telling my oldest son, Dylan, I'm like, yeah, I met this guy, Sean Cannell. And he's like this YouTube expert. And Dylan was like, man, everything that I know and have done on YouTube, which Dylan's been pretty successful with, he said, I learned from Sean Cannell. And it's amazing, you know, just having people like you, adults that are in our kids' lives and have really impacted our kids. And so I'm honored and grateful um, that you're that person. So not only having influence on my son, but on me. And ever since that call in Mexico City, and we talked about this a little bit off camera, I've just started thinking about if I just put the amount of time and energy into YouTube that I put everywhere else, I wonder where I'd be today. So selfishly, I'm really excited for the audience and for us to unpack this conversation. Hey guys, unfortunately, as we get into this episode, we lost the first little bit of the video. It was really just the first question that I asked Sean. And so we're gonna do a quick static image of the question and Sean's answer. This is something that you don't want to miss. It's only about 30, maybe 45 seconds, and then we'll get back into the full video. So hope you enjoy the episode. I always ask four questions. We're not going to get into all four because I have a million other questions, but I do want to start with one of them modified a little bit. If you could narrow it down to one thing that has had the greatest impact on your success on YouTube in parentheses, what would that be? The one thing that has had, um, that has caused the greatest success on YouTube for me is creating search based evergreen content connected to passive income streams. I'll explain what that is briefly and say that talking to your community community is one of my favorite types of communities to speak with because y'all understand leverage. And so in real estate and investing, uh, you understand the superpower of compound interest and you understand, you know, leverage and the powerful thing about YouTube itself. And then this particular type of content on YouTube, as you mentioned, man, if I would have been investing in YouTube, like I've been investing in Instagram, I'd be a lot further. And I agree with that because YouTube is the only platform where your content lives forever. Mm -hmm. And search-based content, especially in a context of teaching investing, teaching taxes, talking about real estate and the, you know, 38 different, you know, mobile homes, land, you know, agents, loan officers, investors of all kinds and all kinds of other education. I, I originally started teaching video because I got started in video in my local church. And so what I discovered was that because YouTube was a search engine and because that it was different than every other platform, it was a content library, not a content feed. You just have an Instagram feed. People see stuff today. They don't watch it a year from now. They don't see it a year from now. Whereas I started realizing, wait a minute, if I create a video that has a much longer shelf life, it cannot just be viewed this today, next week, next month, but even years from now. But then what I discovered was I first started teaching video because that was my skill set. So I had these cameras and these lenses and this technology. And so I started to create videos like comparing the Canon 7D to the Canon 70D, which is actually a search term when someone's going to make a buying decision on YouTube. They look for that. And then I started with affiliate marketing, which was highly leveraged because although I was only making 4% um, off a transaction on Amazon.com, I wasn't doing any of the shipping. I didn't have to hire anybody. I didn't have to fire anybody. I didn't have to take the returns. I didn't have to have any kind of infrastructure or distribution or anything at all. I literally just got to create a video one time, put it on the internet. And then as people watch that video, interestingly enough, YouTube pays me, but then also Amazon pays me as people click the link 
can make a purchase. And maybe that's a trickle as it was. The first income I made from Amazon was $2.12 in a month. That's horrible. A lot of people wouldn't would look at that and say, okay, I should probably ignore that and choose a different path or a different strategy. But I understanding the compound effect, I was like, if I just keep doing this and I get better at this, this last month, Amazon sent me a $20,000 check. Over a year, YouTube sends us around $500,000 from ads on our videos. And then now that I've got a much more diverse business, whether I want to sell tickets to an event, sold over 100,000 copies of my book, whether I want to sell a course. And what thousands of students have also now experienced with us is whether they want more transactions or just more leads or grow their newsletter or whatever it is. So that is a long explanation to the answer of creating search-based videos. Are they going to last forever and ever and ever? Well, maybe not, but they I've got videos that are 10 years old that grew my channel by 50 subscribers and paid me 20 bucks. And they were terrible 10 years ago too. We always start with horrible videos, you know? And so it's leverage. And so search-based evergreen content on YouTube that can grow your brand, your business, your leads, your clients while you're asleep. Um, that's what I bet everything on really and just continue to compound. And today it's created an eight figure business and 30 people on staff, and <laughs> quite a bit of, um, of scale to it because of really tapping into that one strategy. You know, I love the comparison of the leverage because, you know, and again, my audience, we're always talking about who, not how, like, how do we, how do we hire more people for sales and mark like, but this whole leverage conversation and, and even the searchability and I, this is somewhat irrelevant, but honestly, I, I even, I've used your channel and your team to even set up my new setting. I was having some challenges with my Sony and I was running it through an Elgato with a cam link and it was overheating. And I just, I, I started searching and you guys popped up talking about the ZV10 and how you can just directly connect the ZV10 into a computer and you don't need all this other stuff. And I was like, there's my solution. And then like, I'm watching your YouTube channel, like figuring out how to set it up, set the settings so that it automatically, anyway, so, so such a great analogy because as I've been kind of watching and dissecting what you guys do, I'm like trying to figure out like, how do I apply that to my own, you know, world? And so on that note, what I, I just want to talk quickly about, you know, I've got a couple avatars that I want to just talk about, like Jim, he's this guy that's working for a private equity group. He wants to launch his own private equity company. And, and he's kind of figuring this out. And obviously we need to build brands. You know, this old saying of people do business with people they know, like, and trust. I mean, the shortening the life cycle of an investor is so much easier when we have a brand out there drawing attention, all of the above. You know, another guy, his name's Chris. I'm making these names up, obviously, but he's a high paid W2 guy, been on the treadmill in his job for, you know, 10, 15 years. And he wants to launch his own business. And I would say kind of like the third and fourth avatar it's this guy named John and, you know, he flips 12 homes a year. He keeps three of those as investments. He's a real estate agent and he really wants to just, you know, kind of build his brand and start coaching. And then the last person I'll say, and I actually have a lot of doctors, lawyers, you know, a high net worth individuals listen to the show that actually, you know, want to grow their investment portfolio and they're looking at all of this. So I just kind of want to set some context there because I think those are the guys that we're really talking to primarily. And I think the first three, and I think you could squash maybe a limiting belief in my mind and maybe the audiences in the first three, I think, you know, we would say all day long, dude, YouTube can definitely like help you just build your business, build your brand. But what do you say to like the high net worth doctor lawyer that just loves his business? We call it vertical income. He wants to build more horizontal income. How could YouTube help him? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you don't want to build a personal brand, then you maybe shouldn't start a YouTube channel. If you don't, if you also don't want more money and you've got too much, my email address is sean at thinkmedia.com I, I, and you can PayPal me. If, if you don't want more leads or clients or, and I think the big formula for most YouTube channels is you've done the thing and now you actually have a desire to teach the thing mm -hmm. because as soon as you shift into teach the thing, you actually might be able to build a bigger business than you ever even did doing the thing. Speaking of, literally of a doctor is one of our students, Dr. Eye Health is his YouTube channel. He's an optometrist. And so he was doing the thing. Obviously, he got his degree, knew all about eyes. It was all contact lenses, uh, visual floaters, different eye diseases, how dry eyes, how to keep how, eye health, all this 
different stuff. People come to see him. He's like, okay, well, if I take my brand on YouTube or if I start building a brand on YouTube, is there a market for this? Well, a lot of people on earth have eyes. So there's a pretty good, like to the total addressable market, it's pretty big because people are looking for, um, you know, best context. Why is this happening? Um, and he started to, but he did commit to being on camera and becoming Dr. Eye Health. His name's Joey. And so he started to post videos. Well, fast forward to today, I think he has 600, 700,000 subscribers. Um, he was making, of course, great money as an eye doctor. But last time I checked, which was a long time ago, he was at 20, 30K a month just from online business rev, hiring a team, building around it, and add almost infinite scale to it because of because of leverage. The internet, one video made one time. It's a good book. The, the Almanac uh, of Neville Ravikant is a famous book, right? And he talks about like four ways of leverage. And, and one of those is team. And one of those might be interest. One of them's media. Like that's mm. essentially what we're talking about. We're talking about media. And so if the doctor said it kind of joking, but seriously, if, if it's like, well, I don't really want to like build a new thing or I don't want to do work. And I know that everybody listening to this is a hustler and they like to work, but the type of work they like doing might be reviewing investment deals and doing and moving some stuff around and networking. But if you don't want to get on camera and start a show or get on Zoom and start a video podcast, well, th that's a big friction point. Like you literally don't want to do the main, vehicle and you can scale a lot of stuff but you can't you're gonna need to do what exactly what you're doing right now at least have conversations with people and i think that's the leverage point a lot of people could start an interview show start a, a video podcast which is a highly leveraged the highest leverage uh, form of content and we could talk about that a little bit later so that would be if you've if you're bought into that what's waiting for you on the other side um this is why so many people in real estate go from if they've had some real estate success, they move into teaching real estate and they make 10x more money. That's it's, it's not a new model. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki, uh, rich dad, poor dad, you know, obviously it multiplied by every single real estate guru, you know, but I think about my friend Ryan Pineda, who was flipping 100 homes a year. Mm -hmm. um, but once he started doing content, he was like, I can make so much more money. So, so much more scale, so much more impact. And he's put operators though in all of his other businesses. So now he has six, seven businesses, but nevertheless, it, there is that commitment. That's that commitment to say, okay, do I kind of want to go that author, speaker, content publisher? Do I want to build a media company? Do I want to create a bigger legacy? Do I want to make a bigger impact? And it's not a right or wrong answer. It's a self-awareness answer. Um, but for the doctor, that's the move. Think about the some of the published doctors out there. Think about some of the people that are shaping thought leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, if you write an all-time book, that's just still just the tip of the iceberg. There's the media channel, the podcast to support it, basically, the um, content to support it. You think about Jordan Peterson, who is just, you know, teaching in Toronto, and he's a psychologist. And in a way, he kind of talks about accidental success. Um, but he, he's just given lectures. I don't think his vision was thinking like, I'm going to scale and impact media, writes a Quora post that kind of goes viral. They kind of turned that into a book. That book's over 5 million copies sold, but now the daily wire brought him on. And what is essentially Jordan Peterson's a content creator now. And he went from like the small, like teaching in a university and in colleges to being New York times said, one of the leading thought leaders on planet earth. Are all of us going to be at that scale? Well, of course not. But the long tail of opportunity exists for everyone. You yeah. just are adding levers of scale and impact when you start tapping into media. Yeah, so good. And, you know, one of one of my mentors always says you're, you know, just one relationship, one connection. You know, most people like what you're talking about with like Jordan Peterson, we didn't start out this way. But I think whether it's the doctor or, you know, the other three avatars, like I, I talk to people about this all the time. And my epiphany was probably in 2018, 2019. I realized then that there's a day coming where I'm no longer going to be the mobile home park investor guy. It's no longer about this product because I, when I sold my business in 2014, I often say that was the best and worst day of my life. I had spent 10 years building this plumbing, heating, construction business, and then I sell it. And my purpose and my whole identity kind of went away with it. I didn't have the awakening or the epiphany, but in like 2018, we started talking about selling our mobile home park portfolio and what that looked like in the next five years. And I started realizing, Sean, I'm like, there's a day coming round two where I'm no longer, you know, Mike, the mobile home park guy. And I started thinking, I heard Gary V say this. He said, you know, there's a day coming where every single business owner, just like you have an accounting team, sales team, blah, 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 operations team, people in the field, you're going to have a media team on site or you're going to get left behind. And that was like a moment for me 
And, you know, I, I didn't immediately act on it, but I think we're still early on this. And even with like, I think there's so many brick and mortar business types, you know, like the flipper guy and, and the guy that's, you know, wanting to launch his private equity group. And we just, I hear this so much. I don't want to be an influencer. There's such a negative connotation to people that are like, you know, just building their brand. And that's the only reason they're doing it. When I had my plumbing and heating company, the marketing was yellow pages. I'm kind of dating myself here, but it was yellow pages, billboard. Honestly, one of our greatest leads was our wrapped vehicles. And so these were like, these were like radio. We bought radio ads. We bought TV spots. That is a completely different when you talk about media and this is like your wheelhouse, your companies think media. I think there's this mindset block with brick and mortar, you know, and maybe it's a generational gap thing too, but just like I had my awakening and I realized if I don't make this shift to where the eyeballs are today, I'm going to get left behind. And so, you know, if you would just kind of address that and maybe, maybe speak to that on people that are, have not yet realized that, that this whole move is happening with or without them. My response to this question is a couple of stories. One, um, my wife, Sonia, and I love going to Leavenworth, Washington. It's a small Bavarian town, a couple hours away from Seattle, Washington. You drive over the mountains in winter. They do a whole Christmas lighting. It's just enchanting. It's magical. And you get some hot cocoa and walk the streets and Christmas shopping. Well, we've been there a lot. Like we pretty much go annually. It's kind of a vibe during Oktoberfest, summer all uh, kind of a different vibe year round, but it is a tourist town, no doubt. And so you've got all kinds of, as everyone listening can imagine, these shops with kind of a little cottage clothes and a women's vibe shop, and then like kind of a souvenir thing or mountaineering shop because we're in the mountains and, you know, little tchotchkes that people could purchase or art and there's wineries. So certain times we've been there though, it has been a ghost town. It is mm. like just nobody there. And I often walk into these shops and someone's behind the counter and I'm thinking they they opened up today turn on the power hired somebody work to work by the register and and like nobody's coming in today you know we we pop in and we like sort of look for a second don't buy anything and and there's a lot of waste in that moment because they're a local brick and mortar business like at the mercy of the seasonality the foot traffic the time of year and all that kind of stuff and and any brick and mortar business owner would know that a lot of times Christmas shopping alone is probably where they hopefully reach profitability because if it wasn't for like that season at the end of the year if they added you know every that's what pays for the down times to stay open and a lot of these shops um you know a lot of they're closed they're like we go sonia's like so excited my wife and then we'll go down there and it's like close and that's like close on monday close on tuesday and they only open like three days a week that's happening in restaurants right now because of staffing all these limiting all these different factors well because when i'm walking around she's shopping i'm thinking and i can't not think about business and entrepreneurship and whatnot a lot of times these shops are two floors in this uh cool little main strip and on the second floor is where all the clearance is it's like horrible up there nobody goes up there and it's sort of like a cool loft attic kind of vibe and i always go okay if i was this shop owner i would uh move not into 2023 i'd move into like 2012 like people need to get you talk about like you're getting left behind like this is what i would have done 10 years ago but the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago the second best time is now i would actually kind of shut down the upstairs i would uh uh build a studio simple but like what we're looking at with yours i would i would set up a way to create content just and and i would start a show of some kind and that show in some of these uh, shops could be kind of like a decor discussion. It could be like you you interview, especially here, because there's all these uh, boho hat wearing local kind of female raising their kids, kind of a faith based town, a lot of like kind of Christians in the town. So maybe you have a conversation. Um, you start, and this is this is a big unlock here. The show could be maybe on like motherhood. The show is maybe a kind of like a women's lifestyle show. And yes, it's like brought to you by, and you're sort of based there. And you also, part of it could be kind of QVC based. Mm. And 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 this up, upper, or, or that'd be like another type of content you start putting on the channel. And so when I shut down this up upstairs of clearance stuff, instead of just, and, and focus on building out a studio, I'd also build out a little shipping department for e-commerce mm. and, and realize that the internet exists. And not only could I create content and media, but I could also think about shipping and sending things from the shop. But here's even a deeper level is what's kind of funny is sometimes the local shop, kind of like the local bookstore, is at the mercy of thinking we have to keep the prices high because because of our mar margins, because of this, we can't compete with Amazon and Amazon's going to kill the little guy. If I was that business owner, I would 
would link to Amazon affiliate links to the books I'm talking about that actually exist in the short store. The people don't even live where you are and it's probably inefficient for you. So I'd go into affiliate. I'd rather talk about the product and sell it from somewhere else and make a few bucks and they can ship it. It's a two, almost two different audiences, yeah. but a lot of business owners would be insecure and fearful. And they think that one business would cannibalize the other, but actually that could be a good thing because mm -hmm. sometimes you want to disrupt yourself out of business. If that's the case, because at least you're set up before everybody else on the street, because zero people are doing this. And so, um, you know, that's kind of how I would think about it. And I would start leaning into to media. And if you're a shop owner and you already curate, we go to this one, um, we bought a fire truck. My cousins bought a fire, tr fire truck for my son from this amazing toy shop. Kids content, toys in like a well-lit little build a kind of train area with some mountains and some spray paint and start a kid's channel. Like you, you have a toy shop. You're probably passionate about mm -hmm. the playing with toys and whatnot get your teenagers involved pay them a few bucks or cut them in on what the channel will be when the monetization so it, it's just kind of a different way of thinking and that's how i think that a brick and mortar business could could uh could jump into this again during the pandemic i think about canlis kind of unrelated to youtube but more into social media and just thinking outside of the box it's one of the top restaurants in seattle and, um, you know, four star, or five star restaurant or whatever. It's just an amazing place. Really cool story with the founder. And when restaurants got shut down, most restaurants just waited. They didn't know what to do. Canlis launched three businesses. They launched a drive up um, breakfast business where you would pick up like a, a bagel with the egg and cheese on it, which is also different than their normal menu. They got outside of the ego and sometimes the myopic perspective that can happen when we're just kind of doing the thing and we don't really want to disrupt ourselves and innovate and think outside of the box. So they launched that. They launched a lunch bag uh, um, uh, drive drive up for lunch. And then at night, they they launched a pickup, you know, mainly kind of ready meal that you take home. And they, they always had live piano player that's really great at piano when you come into the restaurant. They live stream that. So you had live music from their piano player you pick up a bottle of wine, you pick up the food that you take home, and you would just basically take Canlis home. And then they use social media to spread the word. They had they built kind of hype and momentum around it. Like, okay, there's only you know such and such remaining. All right, we're all sold out of breakfast. We'll see you at lunch. And they innovated and adapted when they were forced to shut down through the pandemic. So to your point about this being not just a good idea, but potentially insurance, like, you know, to be prepared for what's coming or how your business would get disrupted. And the final point I would make is that, again, for most local businesses, if you started a YouTube channel, would do I think that that would actually like grow your local business locally? In most cases, no, especially mm -hmm. in the short term. Of course, paid ads, just like any other platform, you could advertise within a zip code and bring awareness. So that's sort of a different conversation. But what a local business should do is take the inefficiency of their business or take an aspect of their business and launch a worldwide media company that in a way is an entirely separate strategy. But long term, eventually everyone's coming to Leavenworth, Washington, once you've got 166,000 subscribers, it's like, oh my gosh, I've been listening to your guys's, you know, women's living podcast, you guys are so cool, your shop owners. We, we, we actually found out about Leavenworth and decided to finally visit seven and a half years later because we wanted to meet you guys. And, and one final story is Mindy Lawthorne from the Wellspring, um, you know, started, we were talking and she wanted to do something like this. She felt like she wanted to have conversation with specifically other moms. Um, and she is the owner of a brick and mortar wedding dress shop in Utah that is established they got square foot fair square footage it's kind of a whole vibe that mainly uh young brides coming to get married uh it's a whole vibe they you know treat them really nice their social media is pretty they're doing vertical video and whatnot but i was like you need to start your show mm -hmm. and her shop is called try something new her show is going to be called try something new and i also was like what's the legacy you she goes i kind of feel like a big sister already i'm uh, to to young brides getting married and while they're coming we have that touch point and they kind of you know they're sort of a, sometimes a mentor they kind of look up to me 
And I was like, why aren't you thinking about the lifetime customer journey? Why aren't you thinking about the lifetime of mentorship? Why aren't you thinking about the lifetime of discipleship of if somebody not only comes to the shop, but listens to your show at directed at women, faith-based perspective. How do you build a great life? Also, the dress and the wedding is a temporary transaction, ultimately, because mm -hmm. to make that thing last, it's going to be a lot more than a dress and a nice wedding, as anybody that is married knows that, that that marriage is hard. So what if, so when you now have this vehicle of just ongoing content and touch points and no like and trust, and eventually maybe their daughters, you go real legacy, will will come back and like, that's the place where we, we um, you know, get our dresses and that's where we built our community and all our bridesmaids. And I think they've got, you know, the groom and everything else too. And so she took action and dedicated uh, some square footage of their brick and mortar to building a studio and it's behind glass. And what's interesting about that is because people can come in and they can maybe see if someone, people visit a local entrepreneur, a local mom, a local pastor, a local whatever comes on the show. People are like, this is so cool. And, and start building the brand of the show. And again, I think the big thing was that she crossed the mental mindset of this is something I do actually want to do. <laughs> That's a big one at first, you know, because yeah. by the way, I, I'm pretty sure her business, her and her husband, you know, with investments and with how good the business is doing everything else, like finances aren't like the biggest challenge uh, right now. You know what I mean? Like they're not yeah. about to go, they're going to be okay. So, so I think it is also kind of the law of sacrifice. It's biting the bullet that like, it's going to be tough. Like you, you got to kind of want to at least know. And I would argue if you're listening to this, you should want to commit to this for at least three years mm. because it, it, it doesn't happen fast yeah. and it doesn't make three years could also make a significant impact and maybe you choose to shut it down, but I wouldn't even start it. If at least you can't accept the fact that great things take time, no matter what it is, like nobody mm -hmm. builds a world-class business in less than three years by three years. It's probably not world-class. That's just the time you reach profitability. Like, so, so starting the media company, but she's like, yeah, I know this is something I want to do. I want a bigger impact. I want bigger legacy. I want the conversation to last, last longer than the dress transaction. I actually am thinking about how could I be a part of these brides' lives? How could I also do something I love to do? How could I have awesome conversations with cool people um, starting a video podcast? And then how can I multiply that? But then fast forward, and I know I'm, I'm putting a lot out there, but when you also look on the other side of not just three years, but like 10 years later, now a and &E wants to do a show because you've been doing this like startup podcast. There's a business. What? Tell us more about this. Now they want to come to Leavenworth because wait a minute, this is how you guys adapted and pivoted and started using social media and YouTube. Now you've launched your own product line and reinvested. Now you're shipping e-commerce all around the world. Now you've started some kind of membership, monthly membership type of thing. And so maybe a $10 million business goes to a hundred million dollars because again of leveraging media. And so that's kind of what I would say to, to, uh, to small business owners, kind of three stories, three, one hypothetical, one true, and just different ways of thinking about how absolutely you could lean into media and pivot in a 2023 world and beyond. Yeah. And I agree, man. Um, you know, I, I think we should all just be pausing and like, what's that upper room space that we need to move into. And, you know, on the, um, on the, the, the dress shop with Mindy, um, you know, Kara and I were, we, we know them and as well through the wellspring and, uh, Dylan and Hannah, my future daughter-in-law are getting married. And Kara was like, we should go to Colorado Springs and go to Mindy's store. And, and the fact that, so Hannah then was like, oh yeah, I've been following her on Instagram and can see all of her stuff. So this is like a real world, you know, situation where if, if Kara had said that to Hannah, let's go take a trip and go dress shopping, get on an airplane, grab this, you know, the mom and the sister and Kara and, and my daughter and travel to Colorado Springs and go dress shopping. Like without any context, Hannah would be like, why would we do that? But the fact that, you know, Mindy has done a great job with her YouTube channel, Instagram, it's like the way she's doing it in the show, Hannah had already seen her stuff and has been following it and was like, yeah, this looks fun. But if that hadn't been out there, if Mindy hadn't been listening to you and putting that information out there, the Hannahs of the world would probably be like, why would we go to Colorado Springs to do that? doesn't make any sense. So powerful. And the power of brand, the power of building the emotions and the colors and the mystique and the value and the touch point and what do people think about when they think about you, you know, that brand media is uh, that branding lever. People mm -hmm. see you. I see you everywhere. 
you know, they're, they're hearing from you. And then for the business owner, they're also connecting with you in a non-sales context. Very important because our style at Think Media, our company is we call ourselves farmers, not hunters. Um, some of, and that's our approach to sales. Some people in sales, uh, you know, it's a lot more of an aggressive approach, like hammer, hammer, close, 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 which is a certain style. We've learned, especially when it comes to content, we use a very sophisticated software called Wicked Reports that can track as we meet people on the internet. Um, they may come in through an opt-in to watch a class, like 99% of people watching this, like a free webinar. They don't watch it because they're too busy, you know, they're too busy. Like they will want to, they can watch the first five minutes, they get busy. So like, you got to kind of know in modern marketing, like again, just because someone signs up, that's why we follow up multiple times. Someone, it's totally true. How many leads go cold? So we get a lead. We see like, okay, they signed up for a class. They didn't watch it. We also then see that they interacted for social media over the next couple of months. Then they signed up for one of our three-day challenges, actually consumed it, didn't buy anything. Six, seven, eight months later, they go through it again. They go through the same thing that's like the same information, but it might seem very obvious to me, but for somebody new, it's like a fire hose thinking about all this stuff. So they go through it again, or they're also financial circumstances have shifted, or they've just been in the consideration phase of research and whatnot. And so things have happened in their life that now they're actually in the clarity personally that this is something they want to do. And so they make the purchase. And so then we can look in this. It's so cool to we look in Wicked Reports and we actually can look at the customer journey of one person and see that modern marketing, and I think with Google did a lot on this, um, modern marketing, there used to be the law of seven in marketing, like you need seven touch points to actually convert a lead or convert a sale. It's such an outdated number that it's laughable. It's not like seven, it's like 70. And mm -hmm. when it comes to like, a woman buying a minivan, think with Google, it's like 700. It's all the Google searches, the comparisons. They watch two YouTube videos. They go back. They could, they go on Edmonds. They look at the used car price. And then they finally buy the Toyota Sienna in a baby blue color, the one that's raised and has the rack and the moonroof. Like there's a lot of research that can happen. And so the power of content is also realizing that if someone is going to invest with you, right? There's so much to even just getting to know you and kind of hang out and, and a podcast, a video podcast and a YouTube channel is the best way to do that because they start seeing, you know, what you're talking about, a little bit of your values come through. They start seeing what you value. They hear stories about your family and you, you know, they hear all that kind of stuff. It, as Gary Vee often says, it's small, small town rules. Mm -hmm. It actually, even though we're on a big internet, it's still small town rules where you do want to know. Can I trust that person? Can I look them in the eye? Even if I'm only looking them on the eye on the internet, hearing their voice, knowing what they value, seeing their track record, hearing different stories, and then also seeing the compound value that they're adding to your life. The cool thing about what Mindy's doing is you want to find a vehicle. If possible, you could do something very practical where you're just like teaching one thing on your YouTube channel. Um, but that's great. The challenge with it is a lot of times people will learn for seasons. They'll learn the one thing and then they won't follow you any longer. Mm -hmm. Fine. But you're just aware of that. The flip side is what does it look like to actually follow somebody for life? Is that possible? And being from ministry world and church world, it's very possible when you th start thinking about like, oh yeah, I've been listening to like this person's business Bible study for 22 years. I've been listening to Jordan Peterson, I've been whoever, you know, and if it's also something that's kind of like an evolution or, or the lifespan of how someone listens could be longer. A lot of people listen to Joe Rogan just cause very variety content. He's the center of that universe, talking to comedians, talking to politicians, talking to people on the left and the right, talking to people, but it's like the Joe Rogan show. And so having kind of a show is the greatest asset in the modern world because now people are just coming along, getting value on their commute, getting value while they're working out. And then whenever you launch something or launch something with somebody else in a JV affiliate relationship or partner up with somebody, you just have people paying attention, but also people paying attention that that know you, that, that have been growing in trust with you. And then of course, stewarding that trust with the audience is everything because you know, a reputation could take 25 years to build and five years to to destroy. And of course, we all can make mistakes, but being very thoughtful that and very selective of, if you will, what we promote or what we pass along to our audience. But the person who can build and steward a legacy, it's the Oprah effect. 
Any book Oprah said was like on her book thing was a best instant bestseller because of the Oprah effect. But that also for oh, Oprah is a unicorn and unrelatable. But yeah, I mean, probably true. But also look at the level of hustle and work and years and decades it took to build that brand. And again, every single one of us, I do believe this, can do this. And at the small scale, it's worth it. You might only have 55 listeners to your video podcast peak. But also if those 55 listeners are all worth $100 million, because the reason they listen to you is because the type of information you're sharing is a little niche podcast that nobody else can even understand. And, and that's on, you know, then ultimately you're on the journey together and, and a YouTube channel, video, I've said it a lot, video podcasting simply mean that turn on Zoom just like we are, or build out a studio so that you can put up the video, you can also put up the audio, and then you can chop it up and also leverage every other social media platform because you're able to cut out clips and have real leverage with your content. Yeah. I, you know, and I've said so long, like it's impossible to steer a parked car. Like, I think there's so many people that want to do what you're saying, but they're like sitting in the driver's seat it's in park and you just can't adjust. And so, you know, the one thing that I've realized is like, just get started because then you can find the think medias along the way you can adjust as you learn and realize what's working and not working. But, you know, as you're saying all that too, there's, I had Keith Weinhold who has this podcast, um, that I don't know, he's been doing it since like 2011, 2012. And I've learned so much from him. It's get rich education. And as I was talking to him, he's an introvert. He's like this extreme introvert. And I, I listened to his podcast for like three or four years before I actually met him. Karen, I've had, you know, multiple lunches and spent a lot of time with him. And you can tell, like when you're sitting with him, you can tell he's an introvert. But the thing that he always talked about is like, this gave him the platform to share his truth. And there's so many people that are like, well, like even what you're talking about, like with Oprah and, you know, they look at a Sean sometimes or a Mike and they're like, well, yeah, but these guys are just like, you know, charismatic and whatever it Keith Weinhold is an extreme introvert. And I've realized this too. There's nothing more uncomfortable for me. And I've learned to push through this, but walk into a room of a hundred people where I don't know anybody. And over in the corner is three guys. And I like kind of edge my way in. And I'm like, hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but not really, because I need to interrupt. It's just so uncomfortable. And the thing that I realized is like, the more you build your brand and remain authentic to who you are, I think that's a really, Keith and I were talking about this. That's like a really important point. If you show up authentically on your channel, whatever it is that you're putting out there, it makes those relationships. You said earlier, you know, being able to spend an hour with a Sean Cannell, like this is one of the main reasons why I love podcasting, because I get to spend an hour with people every single week that I would probably never spend an hour with. And it opens up so many avenues, whether, you know, you want to raise capital, whether you want more deal flow, whether you're a real estate agent, whether you want to produce content, it doesn't really matter. There was a guy that walked into my living room. We, Karen and I did a couple's event um, last November and he listens to every single episode. His name's Rich. That's his actual name. He's probably listening to this, but he walked in the front door and he said, you know, as we started talking, he's like, Mike, you don't have any idea who I am. I have listened to your podcast since episode one. And I just feel like I know you. And I was like, this is really weird because I'm on like episode 300. The guy has never reached out to me. He's never commented on a post, but he shows up in my living room from Indiana to Austin, Texas to spend a weekend with Kara and I. So finally, after three years and listening to every single episode, we finally gave some offering that he bid on. And since then, he's joined our, he literally signed up for a couple's trip to Cabo San Lucas that we're doing in September yesterday. That's like $12,500. They've bought every single thing since then. But my point in all of this, and I'll throw it back to you is like, you know, you just don't know those 70 impressions, like every single episode for twice a week for three years before he showed up in my living room. But like I was consistent. And I'm so glad you shared that story. Cause that I think the three years happens to be a magical number coming up in this conversation in the fact that it just took so much time. You were consistent, but also like that real relationship can bloom, not just over three weeks, but over three years. Um, so someone really gets to know you and decides that they would want to go to Cabo with you because by that time they have a pretty good idea, you know, and, and by that time with that much content, like it's one thing, like, can I trust this person's vibe or where they're coming from? Like multiplied over enough time, you're like, you pretty much know what you're going to get. And so um, I, I, not, I believe 100% in authenticity. 
And what's interesting is I read a book uh, when I was in a PR position for a church. PR sounds kind of funny, but it's more of a communications, but I was studying PR and there's a book called Radical Transparency. And it was also just a kind of about like, everyone's wants privacy, fine. You probably need to get off the grid, you know, disconnect, stop using a phone because we're just kind of probably living in a world that's not gonna have privacy. Um, and in radical transparency, it was sort of this idea that like, we just have to accept the fact that who we are is who we are and everything's going to be on the internet. So the real thing is rather than being a person that needs to hide anything is actually just being a person who's okay to have everything exposed. Well, when that's true and someone sees it all and they see the vulnerability and the authenticity, you become a real easy person to do business with as they get to know you over the years. And so that's really cool. And I also love that what you mentioned, yeah, just for, even if it didn't grow, just for the friendships that build, the conversations that you have, the discipline of connecting with smart, diverse people from different backgrounds, you it'll create so much serendipity. One of my favorite books is called Business Secrets from the Bible. It's written by a rabbi, Daniel Rabbi Lapin, who is uh, studies kind of the Hebrew language, language. And what they notice is that everybody would agree, no matter how, make, how it makes them feel, that Jewish people have been historically and consistently financially successful. The unique thing is uh, not because of, um, you know, you can't, you could learn some stuff from Donald Trump, but none of us inher in inherited thousands of apartments. He did well with it, but most of us didn't inherit thousands of apartments. You could learn some stuff from Bill Gates, but you weren't born at the right time at the university when technology was coming out with his mentality. So you missed the timing and you may not be a genius or you may not have the IQ. So Daniel Rabbi Lapin's argument is if you look at the Jewish people, different IQs, different businesses, it's different. You don't have to be super smart. You don't have to just be in tech at the right time. You don't have to just be at uh, all these different things. It, it has been proven now over hundreds and thousands of years. That was a long story to make one point from the book. And that is that your wealth will be directly correlated to the amount of friends you have. Mm, that's so good. By the way, one of my favorite books, Thou Shalt Prosper by Daniel Lapp. I mean, I just love this. It's guy. probably some of the overlap. It, the Bible business secrets from the Bible is the second one. And and, and that's when you start thinking about scaling. And when I think about friendship is again, you know, your Facebook friends may or may not be your actual friends, but we're, we're talking about, and these aren't going to be the same people that maybe come to your funeral or come to Thanksgiving. But if somebody's listening to your podcast for an hour a week for three years, and I know that's also one way, at least at the time until you're hanging out in Cabo, but that's depth. Mm -hmm. They're probably listening to you more than they're listening to their parents. You know, yeah. they're talking, they literally have you talking them to more like, dude, you need to call your mom. He hasn't, he hasn't called his mom in a while. Like, you know, he's not talking to her for an hour a week or maybe he is, but you get the idea. That's just so much uh, of depth and trust. And, the, and then you're also top of mind because of all of that. So what, well, what's it going to lead to in this moment? If you're looking for short-term transactions, always a losing business strategy, as we agree. If you're trying to just close and rush and you're just blowing past people. But if you have that more farmer mentality where I'm just trying to cultivate good relationships, I'm just trying to maintain and stay solid with strong character. I'm just trying to have integrity in my business practices. And I'm also just trying to strategically and wisely pivot and adapt to changing things. Like, shoot, you and I, we, we've done Wellspring. I've looked at your investment. I haven't jumped in yet. I just saw your another thing with the 12%. I hit with an ad maybe, or maybe it was just on your stories. Thought about it again because I follow you on social media. And maybe we do that. But maybe in 18 months, you and I, are we're like, hey, because you're doing this thing and I've got this thing, let's actually like team up and like do an event in person. And let's, you know, we'll, we'll do it in San Diego. You know what I mean? Or like, mm -hmm. let's create a physical product together because of friendship yeah. growing over time. Your wealth is directly correlated to the amount of people you know and the amount of people that know you back to why it's so powerful to create media and not just haphazardly or just trying to get, you know, of course, shallow impressions dancing on TikTok. Substantive, meaningful relationships through long form content like it's happening right here. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true too. And, and even though you, you kind of brought this up and people would say that, you know, you can't build deep relationships virtually. I, there's a guy named Brooks McDonald that is actually in the wellspring. He's coming to Ojai. I've never actually met him. Him and I only have a relationship virtually, but we talk all the time. And so I'm like, I, I don't agree with a lot of the conversations that, you know, we're losing, you know, the intimate connection with people. And, and even if there's a level of truth that you can't go as deep, when I actually finally meet Brooks, we're going to go so much deeper, so much faster. And, and so I love that you bring all that up. So I want to be cognizant of your time. We're like literally 
um, five minutes from the top of the hour here. But I have you you brought up a guy a while back, um, uh, one rental at a time, and you were talking about how you know he doesn't really over edit all this stuff, and I think this is valuable for my audience. And and I'll I'll throw this back at you with maybe like a caveat question. Quality versus quantity. And I think so many people don't want to get started because they want to figure everything out before they get going. But somewhere in the middle of all that, can you kind of tell me about one rental at a time? And then, you know, for somebody that's getting started or even they're far into it, do we focus on quality or quantity? Um, okay, I'll be I'll be brief with a three part answer. <laughs> part one, one rental at a time, Michael Zuber. So Michael Zuber. Uh, had a degree in finance, was working in the corporate world, invested his uh, savings and money that he could take from his salary into one rental at a time. Expert in single family um, and is very self-aware that that's the thing he's done. And um, compared to, I'm sure people listen to this, all kind of apartment buildings and syndications and at scale, all kinds of different stuff. He really has just owned and crushed his world and retired at a young age and was able to went all in on his YouTube channel. When you said he doesn't over edit his videos, even that was an overstatement. He doesn't edit his videos and edit, he has conversations. He uses Zoom. So here we are and everybody listening to this knows how to use Zoom. Throw up a webcam, get a USB microphone like this and um, you know, he has conversations. He does with the daily financial news. He built it off of his habit. He wakes up, reads articles for about 90 minutes. And he did that before YouTube. What he realized was like, if I, all this reading that I already do, this is kind of an unlock for like, what should your YouTube channel be about? What you already research, love and learn, what you already are passionate about, he then just does a 10 minute show where he's like, welcome to the daily financial news. Here's five things you need to know today. He'll do it in front of a whiteboard or he'll do it on the road if he's traveling. And he just looks at the notes he's taken, summarizes it. And by the way, it's my news source because he's super smart, really good at finance, filters through all this information. I'm not trying to listen to a lot of the news source out there or the hype or the ads or anything else. And he hits go on live stream and turns it off. And then the rest of his videos is he has conversations and he built up a network of millionaires. And what's really fascinating is he um, takes an hour, like I'm one of his guests, and we'll talk about three things, about 10 to 20 minutes each, start, stop, start, stop. You know what you're about to talk about. And there's the title of the year, YouTube video, there's the topic. Some people are reoccurring guests talking about the Vegas market or the Seattle market or the stock market. And he's just putting out all that type of content his particular strategy is not the only strategy. He's uploaded 11,000 videos. It's it's crazy how many uploads he does, but it's a very simple system. He's got a couple, he's got someone helping him with fun thumbnails, an admin assistant helping him do all of that. So he just jumps on and does what he loves, talks to people, does the financial news. But what's also wild is he made an extra $80,000 this last year from just the ads on his videos. Um, he's making about 400 grand a year from that media brand. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's got his real estate portfolio and then is still just building that up as he, as he wants. And, um, but this is also an impact thing and a passion thing for him. And so I think that you could check out the channel one rental at a time. That's kind of thing one. And I think that that's something to learn from in answer to quality versus quantity. I think thing two is in education content, which is what you and probably everybody listening to this would do. It's what I do. It's really about the content value, not the production value. And that's why I think his strategy works at one rental at a time, because the reason we listen to it, what does matter, the, your actual experience, the stories you tell, the education you've gained, the lessons you've learned, the frameworks you can teach. It's much more of a cerebral um, type of content as is podcasting. You think about production value, you just want a good mic, really. And uh, it's about the actual conversation itself. So in education, quantity, because if you get enough things out there, and he's also, by far, he's playing the quantity game. But the last thing three that I would summarize is a, a really cool framework from Alex Hermosi that I kind of lived, and then I realized he explained it the best. Phase one, it's quantity no matter who you are, because you're just finding out your voice. You're seeing what sticks. 
So it's do as many videos as you can, don't overthink the results. And also then you get feedback. Cause once you've uploaded 40 videos, you go, okay, well four of those got 10 times more views than the other ones. What can I learn about those topics? What can I learn about, should I have that guest on again? Like, what can I learn? So phase one is always quantity. Phase two is quality. Now it's actually, let's refine the chaos. Let's double down on the three or four topics that really resonated. Let me think about how I can improve things. I've noticed how much I say, um, I've noticed all of this. You don't want to, I know, I'm sure most of us are overly stressed. Oh, I'm not great at communicating. It's a, it's practice. It just takes time. And when, and then if you listen and watch your, your stuff back, which I know you're busy, but you want to be like Kobe, who was famous for always watching his game tape, even if he won the game, mm -hmm. because you just wanted to study and, and see how he could improve next time. So, um, it's like, if you ever spoke on stage, you just watch it back and you're like, well, that sucked great because now you can learn i mean that's it's not experience that we, is the best teacher it's evaluated experience so we're evaluating the qu the quantity working on quality but phase three is both and now the hermoses are investing around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month in content that's in human resources videographers editors specialists on every platform at ROA, po ROA positive, by the way, because of the level that he's even calculated the math of what it would cost to buy ads to get the kind of reach they're getting. And it's all organic. Um, there is the fact that it monetizes in the middle, like there's weird income streams that they kind of don't care about at acquisition.com. But the level of leads coming into the bigger play of working towards, you know, I think they're at 200 million a year right now at the portfolio companies. And so they're investing in both a lot of content and the quality is extremely high. Why? Because that's phase three. And now you've leveraged money, a little more experience yourself. You've polished your content a little bit, but now you've hired greatness around you to amplify both quality and quantity. So those are the three phases. So good. And, you know, I talk to people like so often, like I have to get comfortable on camera and, you know, my videos are garbage. And I was looking back the other day at my early videos and I saw you talking about it and you look at Gary V's no. You want your, you got to just get started because nobody's videos are great at the beginning and nobody's watching. So that's like the, I, I love what you just said about, you know, taking those first 40 and get feedback, but there's this idea in our head that we're going to launch and do horrible videos and everybody's going to be watching. And that's just not the truth. Like it's, it's so weird to me, but man, this has been so good. Um, any last words? And then I really, you've got an offer for the audience, which I want you to share and then just share where people can find you because I have learned so much from you and your team at Think Media. It's shifted the way I think in the last four to six months. Well, Mike, I appreciate you. And, and, you know, honestly, just really grateful to hang out with you and your community. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm find, findable everywhere on the internet. Sean Cannell rhymes with YouTube channel. If you want to, uh, connect on LinkedIn or any of the social media platforms. Um, yeah, our course video ranking academy it's super affordable it will teach you not just youtube and the skill sets around that but what i described at the beginning how do you make search-based content around evergreen topics and connect those to passive income streams in a very practical um step-by-step -step, easy to follow format uh, you can link it up in the show notes so people can find a link to the the course um, but it does make me think of whether it's Andrew, who's a real estate agent in Vegas, who just started making videos and is in the top 1% of agents because of taking his business and putting it online or Dr. Eye Health, as we mentioned, these are students. He had only started watching our video, Think Media, uh, our free videos, and then he joined Video Ranking Academy before he knew what camera to buy, what to say, what to do, how to get on camera. He was nervous. He didn't know any of this stuff. And now he has a couple hundred thousand subscribers. And we have people that are tax professionals and investors and professionals of all kind. And people that are also doing things like cooking videos and um, stuff around parenting, or they want to start a Bible study channel, all kinds of different stuff. So yeah, uh, it's called Video Ranked Academy. People can check out the link in your um, show notes so they can find that. And then if people want to check out Think Media, the first words think, the second words media, that is our main YouTube channel. And as you mentioned, uh, all of our stuff related to like tech is free, meaning it's just free on the internet. If it's like, what camera should I buy or how do I start filming a video podcast or whatnot, our course is all about the strategy and getting the views and scaling it up and monetizing. Uh, all our free content is, will help you with the tech, cameras, build a studio um, on any budget, really. So just search Think Media on YouTube, and you can find all of that content. Super grateful. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. And I think uh, I can't wait to hear the stories about 
you know, how people took action on this and, and it really changed their world. Cause it has mine to be completely honest. Like you've, you've changed my, you've shifted my thinking. So thanks again. Thank you, Mike. Sorry for keeping you long, man. No, I appreciate it. I was a little bit late too. You know, I, I got a half hour till my next thing. Everything else going good. Yeah. 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 I'm honestly like, I meant what I said, um, between you and just, you know, seeing some other, th the brick and mortar conversation is like me. Yeah. And then I get around all of you guys and I'm like, and this has been an evolution for me. Like, again, I literally had my kind of awakening in 2018, but it's been like this slow and I'm glad I just got moving. Like I am, I am all of those avatars that I'm talking about. Like, Hello, yeah. Um, but like, honestly, getting into the wellspring has just, because all of you guys are not all, but like the majority of you guys are like in this world. And I'm like, how do I merge? Like, how do I merge these two? And so I'm, I'm like learning a mile a minute. The team is just like scrambling to like, and we're, and the, the last thing I'll say is what are we focusing on and what are we not? And I've looked at everything from the podcast, which I think is doing great to Instagram, which I think is literally not a waste of time, but the amount of time and energy that I've put into there, I'm, I'm shifting all of it because it's there. It's good. I have a, a LinkedIn expert. I would equate her to you coming in a little bit later. Um, that's going to talk to the audience. And it's just like, I'm really focusing on, you know, where's our highest and best return right now. And I genuinely believe it's YouTube. I wonder if you, um, I mean, what you're doing is working. I don't, and you don't need to like move the change much, but I'll, I'll, uh, this video, I, if I was you, I can't scream, uh, uh, share my screen, but if you let me share my screen. Yeah. Let me, uh, um, I sent you a link to, there you go. Um, to StreamYard and, uh, cool thing about StreamYard, well, I think about a couple things. Like this is how you can live stream to multi-platforms. You're already familiar with that, easy, but you could do this perfect recording. It's kind of like Riverside, but StreamYard's better. It's all in one. Um, and the content you're doing right now, I mean, cause it's, because it's like side by side and, and, and then kind of small and shrunk down. What perfect record, record does is it gives you two, um, two my video full screen, high resolution. And then like your video full screen height and you can export it however you want. And so a lot of our videos we shoot in the studio, but maybe this would be like one of them. And so, okay, so this is a great example. So like now an editor can take this really crispy shot of Shannon, this shot of me, uh, and put us both on screen and cut between these different frames. But it also just gives you like a little bit of a higher quality um, clips for how micro content can be produced. Um, and, and then just pushing. So again, uh, results wise is topic content, what's said, but I do think it just the, the evolution. What I love about this is thinking about how can you just work for home? Like you're doing, how can you work from your home office and cre create the best possible final product? And then getting the right people in place to chop that content up would be then the other piece. So like the, however crispy that is, is then thinking about which they could do, but as you know, when you zoom in, as you zoom in zoom, it can kind of just break down or be hard to maybe, you know, mm -hmm. make it as crispy. So, so maybe like, it's going to look like that. It's probably how it looks like for you, but then you're getting the right micro person on the team. That was a long way to answer your thing of like, I shouldn't be focusing on Instagram. No, that's not what I would, I, I, what, what I would do is build a system. And, and the system is that I think about is okay, who's the team and systems in place? And then what is my responsibility to create great content for the top of the content pyramid and then allow it like, so I'm not focusing on Instagram. Sometimes I kind of ignore Instagram for a week, but I still put out a vertical video every day. Mm -hmm. Brian posts it. Um, we get all kinds of leads and and uh, social selling is happening and whatever else. And, and that's on the other side of the whole team, but and then we use these same vertical videos on TikTok and Facebook Reels, and we're doing paid traffic on Facebook, um, on Meta across the board. So, anyways, that's yeah. yeah. So, like, I, meaning if I get my YouTube production crispy, my YouTube workflow and team crispy, thoughtfulness about how you open close maybe sections of the interview, you you do some trending topics, which is what Patrick Bed David does. Talks about the debt ceiling, talks about this, talks about that, and then your system turns that stuff around quick. Mm -hmm. And so that just comes out of that. And that's all on the cloud. So as soon as it's over, it's like in Slack, like, Hey team, my conversation with whoever's done. Um, and, and you might mention, you go, there's a couple good things about 
we actually hit the debt ceiling and he shared some crazy stuff. We talked about Trump DeSantis. We talked about like, which might, that, that's not necessarily off brand. Like mm. how is that going to affect the con? You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, and now we're talking about factors of scale blowing up all of your accounts. Yeah. No. And I agree with hundred um, percent. When I said Instagram, even I'm not saying move away from Instagram, but then this is, I almost feel stupid saying this, but I've spent since 2020 between 4,000 and 6,000 a month for, you know, editors and all this stuff. And the primary focus has been Instagram. Yeah. It's been, you know, from podcast to production to Instagram. So I I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. I'm not saying that I don't want to continue on Instagram. I'm yeah, saying 6, like thousand on YouTube, Instagram is an echo. Yeah, totally. I see you, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh it that hits home and I love what you're saying too. Um this was like a question that I didn't get to but there's a guy that I really have listened to for a lot of years, George Gammon from The Rebel Capitalist and he did these whiteboard videos and he would take really smart people that he can barely understand and then he would condense these whiteboard videos down into something that I can understand and I've been thinking like I need to take George's videos and chop them into something that like my audience can like understand. I can understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, but yeah, like when you were talking about um, one rental at a time and the news and Patrick bet David, this is what I've been really thinking about is that, cause I do the same thing. I look at, I have stacks and stacks and stacks of screenshots and things that I was going to go into Instagram and talk about, you know, trending topics. Um, but I think I need to do that on YouTube. The only question that I would have like the evergreen versus real time, it doesn't matter. You just kind of go and talk about what's live and real. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a mixture of both. Well, the video podcast, yeah, I mean, it's probably a conversation for, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of layers of depth to it. Yeah. You know, it's also, what are you trying to achieve? Like if I'm you, um, a video podcast is not probably an evergreen video. Your own whiteboard video is mm -hmm. how to like, you're like, uh, you know, three ways to slice a such and such deal and you do it on a whiteboard and people are watching that for the next eight, eight years, if it's great and it's positioned properly. And then in the video, you're like, and Hey, if you want to da, 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 opt in link. And so you literally have opt-ins coming for eight years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you upload that on your channel. All right. Well then you have a guest on and who the guest is also could be evergreen. It could be if you had Daniel Rabbi Lapin on, um, he with his own brand and his principles are timeless. And so if it is shared like 12 principles, every Christian business leader needs to know or something like that very well, that could be watched for years. And then on the flip side, you have someone on that. It just wrote a book on, you know, elections. Well, the angle is going to be a shorter term. So it's, it's not either or it's not even, don't even stress about it. It's like knowing the strategy in each context, like knowing which strategy to deploy based on what it is you want to create next or who the guest is. And then the next opportunity though, is clips. We're just now starting them. We're, we've got a pretty big team. So it's been a while, but I'm glad we do everything like, so I did, um, this video. So I did a 32 minute podcast solo round. And then one part of it was what was the seven most profitable niches on YouTube. And that became a clip 10,000 views here an extra 5,000 here. And it's still doing good. Maybe we'll do better than this does and is also already reaching like new people and stuff. So another way to think about short term, long term trending, the full length episode versus one part of it, the full length episode versus the lightning round where you hit trending topics. So there's a million ways we could we could slice it. Um, but that's that's kind of how I would think about it. Yeah, no, I love it. So this what clip, do you we just started clip. So this clip, I mean, it grew the channel by 16 subscribers. Yeah, it's underperforming. But who cares? It's a clip. <laughs> like, so you know what I mean? And so like, it's, it's a not short, it's a clip from the full length video. And so I, I think our current goal is two full length podcasts a week, two to three clips a week, two shorts a week for daily uploads. That makes sense. I've thought about this ever since our last conversation. I mean, obviously you have your course. Do you guys consult or what's your next? Is there a next? I mean, I, uh, besides some one-on-ones, I got two people, uh, we are building that out right now. Cool. We're building out like kind of like Ramsey. He has entree leadership and then he's got a group coaching level and he's got a one-on-one -on -one level and we're just getting all that infrastructure with kids right now and stuff like that. I'm going leveraged. So I've got my product manager, Brooke now working on that, Brian and then myself and that's launching, but like, you know, in, in the meantime, 
if we talked for an hour, uh, a month or something, that that's the only thing that exists right now, like on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that well, just go video ideas, strategy, review some stuff. Um, that's what exists right now. Well, if I'm a, if I'm a good fit for that, send me, send me whatever that looks like. Cause I'm, I'm ever since our Mexico city call, I'm like, I, I gotta, I, cause I'm that guy. Like I need, I need the consistency. So yeah, I feel that. And I know that, and I think it would be a good fit. Uh, cause you, well, you're also have already proven you're committed. You're already doing it and small tweaks lead to giant peaks. And we could talk about, we could look at what guests are coming up, brainstorm titles and literally just work on content together. Yeah. Cause you've already got some good momentum. Yeah. And Tim's here. He's right across from me. Like he, I mean, he's all in on it. I've got a decent editing team that flexes. I'm using the same group that Brandon and Nicholas are using. Finally, um, we're in transition right now, but I'm willing to invest. I've got probably more equipment than you would ever probably tell me to use because I've tried everything. And it's just like, so I just need the brain to keep me on course and correct me along the way. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, I'll have Jordan send that over. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. And I really appreciate you uh, having me on and excited to connect more. Yeah, me too, man. Um, appreciate you. Thanks All for right. your time. All right. Thanks. Yeah.